<coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, today's professional lunch. Um, I'm Anthony Rowley, a former president and, of the club and a current director. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's um, guest to my right, who is David Suzuki, who is um, director and head of global Japanese business at the uh, risk consulting firm of Black Peak, which is a, um, a Hong Kong-based company. Um, I didn't don't have your card. I know. I want to introduce you, but oh, I can't see. Rika. Ah, this is Rika. I'm sorry. To my right. I, um, okay. Um, uh, Mr. Suzuki is going to talk to us today about um, various aspects of the yakuza in uh, or boryokudan in uh, Japan, um, and he'll talk about um, the threats that they pose um, still, um, not in any dramatic sense um, as, for example, the danger of being hit by stray, stray bullets in a gang fight, but more the um, threat that they pose to business operations in Japan. Um, I think this is a matter of real importance um, uh, to businessmen, uh, and not least to foreign businessmen, who will often be unfamiliar with, what, with certain um, aspects um, of what we might call um, doing business in the Japanese way. Um, at a time, I think, when the uh, Abe administration is pushing hard to increase foreign <coughs> business investment in Japan and also to um, improve the standard of corporate governance in this uh, country, um, there, these issues, I think, are, as I said, are very important. Um, uh, the groups, um, uh, as um, Mr. Suzuki will explain, have their tentacles in multiple industries in Japan, including the entertainment industry, sports, real estate, financial services, um, investment, uh, information technology, construction and investment business, and so on. Um, and I think a lot of these activities are little known to most of us. Um, Mr. Suzuki, as I said, is um, head of Black Peak's Tokyo office and over a career which has spanned more than 20 years, he served as an underco undercover operative infiltrating international counterfeiting syndicates, testified as a Hong Kong government criminal prosecution witness, he was a senior manager with the Global Risk Consultancy and founded and ran his own Hong Kong-based risk consulting firm. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Mr. Suzuki. Before I do that, let me remind you, if you have a, um, a KTI uh, a mobile phone, please switch it on to, switch it off or switch it on to manner mode as a courtesy to our guest. So please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Um, uh, I'd like to um, start off by thanking the FCCJ for inviting us here today. Uh, it's a pleasure. And um, um, as Mr. Rowley mentioned, my name is David Suzuki. I, um, <clears throat> I represent Black Peak Group in Japan. Um, before I start my talk, I'd like to um, give my thanks to uh, the many, um, well, to your peers, basically, uh, the many journalists, writers, and researchers who have studied uh, organized crime, Japanese organized crime, extensively. Um, I think it is uh, an important uh, topic uh, worthy of in-depth uh, study and research. Um, there are many, many individuals, uh, and I, I can't name all of them, obviously, but um, a few gentlemen, uh, a few individuals that I'd like to mention um, are Atsushi Mizuguchi, uh, Jake Adelstein, uh, Robert Whiting, uh, Peter Hill, uh, Tomohiko Suzuki, uh, and Takashi Arimori. Um, so thank you to all those um, gentlemen. Uh, we wouldn't be here today without you. Um, as many of you may know already, we uh, came out with a thought piece uh, on the split in the Yamaguchi Gumi. Uh, this was uh, issued last month, and uh, actually we have copies in the back here, and I, I see that uh, uh, some of you already uh, have grabbed a copy, so that's good. Um, 
So um, our briefing today is really uh, just a continuation of our thought piece, uh, but with uh, a focus on how uh, the split uh, in the Yamaguchi Gumi and, um, and how Japanese organized crime in general will uh, continue to impact uh, business in Japan. And um, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to propound a thesis. And that thesis is that um, the Yakuza, or Japanese organized crime, will continue to exist uh, for as long as Japanese society exists. Um, and <clears throat> I believe this is because the authorities, uh, actually, they don't want to abolish uh, organized crime in Japan. Uh, they seek to control it through regulation. So they, they seek to regulate the activities of organized crime. Um, they don't want to abolish the Yakuza uh, because they view the Yakuza as serving uh, an essential function, uh, a crucial function in Japanese society. Um, they kind of act like a pressure release valve. Um, not everybody fits into Japanese society, believe it or not. I mean, there are many, many uh, thousands, tens of, even hundreds of thousands of uh, Japanese people who actually don't fit into Japanese society. So where, where do all these people go? I mean, it, there's, there's tremendous pressures that exist in Japanese society, and people like that uh, feel those pressures. Um, so <clears throat> the Yakuza, um, they, they actually function as one of several pressure release valves in Japanese society. Um, you know, the now, how do they function as a pressure release valve? Well, one big uh, thing that the Yakuza do is that they provide jobs, thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, in fact. Um, the Yakuza are not just involved in illegal uh, activities. They have their tentacles in many different areas of the legitimate economy in Japan. Um, they're, they're active participants in uh, the nuclear industry, which is actually a, a key, it's a tr strategic industry in Japan, as, as you all know. Um, construction, entertainment, uh, which is rather obvious, but entertainment uh, can encompass, you know, bars and restaurants and nightclubs and other types of um, establishments, uh, as well as more sort of sophisticated media type of organizations. Um, and in um, various other industries, uh, they, they um, you know they're they're active participants in. Um, <clears throat> so that's 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 one reason the authorities don't want to abolish uh, the Yakuza. Another reason is that, uh, which I believe to be true, is that um, the authorities would rather deal with the enemy they know. Um, Organized crime is preferable to violent, disorganized crime. And the Yakuza are pretty good at keeping a lid on the ladder. Um, one example I'd, I'd like to point out is, uh, I don't know if uh, some of you remember, a few years ago there was a, uh, an incident at uh, the, the Flower nightclub in Rapongi where um, a bunch of thugs bludgeoned someone to death. Um, and I believe this, this took place, this incident happened when there was sort of a, kind of an ongoing crackdown on the activities of organized crime and this created a vacuum where, you know, these, these thugs were able to operate freely. Um, <clears throat> when, you know, under normal circumstances, something like this probably wouldn't have happened. So that's just one example of how bad things could get if you completely removed uh, organized crime from the equation. Um, another reason uh, that uh, the authorities don't want or, or can't abolish organized crime is that um, they have leverage over uh, certain elements of the power structure. So whenever you see an overzealous legislator, you know, trying to come up with some kind of criminal conspiracy uh, legislation, they usually get hammered down. And uh, I, I won't mention any examples today, but um, you can, you know, do some open source research to see some recent examples of that. Um, now, um, having said all this, um, the laws regulating organized crime in Japan are getting stricter. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in my presentation. 
And um, basically, all of this, um, you know, provides uh, a very, very volatile context within which, you know, people um, and companies have to do business. And this presents risks. These are real risks. So um, I think it would behoove organizations to know what those risks are and, uh, you know, understand how, how to uh, deal with those risks. Um, the, the split in the Yamaguchi Gumi um, just adds fuel to the fire. Um, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, I refer back to my uh, comment about uh, the laws go governing or uh, regulating organized crime becoming stricter. Um, you know, the, uh, these, these organizations, uh, the Yamaguchi Gumi, uh, and, and the newly formed uh, Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi, they have to survive. So, what are they going to do? Are they going to like stop operating? No, they're 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 going to they're going to diversify. They're going to spread their tentacles into other you know new new areas of uh, of the economy. Um, and um, so, you know, this this is all you know uh, this this all uh, comes together to to form a, a volatile mix. So um, today I'll be using a PowerPoint presentation just to give you some uh, contextual information. I'll be going through, um, you know, some detail on the uh, the split in the Yamaguchi Gumi, and uh, also some other background information. Um, so this is how I, I've structured my uh, talk today. Um, I will uh, show you a slide which. Um, basically illustrates the, the current landscape post-split. Um, then I'll sort of go into the, the history of the Yamaguchi Gumi itself. Um, I will show you a, um, a Yamaguchi Gumi hierarchy chart. Um, and this will um, allow you to sort of visualize how uh, significant the split was. And then I'll circle back and I'll, I'll talk about uh, the Yamaguchi Gumi and, and sort of organized crime, Japanese organized crime's uh, involvement in, uh, in, in, in business in general. And um, <clears throat> this will actually, you know, I'll be referring back to my thesis when I get to this uh, part, my presentation. Uh, and then how, uh, you know, I'll be talking about how businesses should, uh, you know, be vigilant uh, to, uh, you know, to, to be able to understand uh, the risks that they face when they, they do business in Japan and uh, how they might uh, mitigate those risks. Then at the very end, I'll, I'll turn things over to my colleague uh, because by then you'll be tired of listening to me and I think uh, it'll be a nice break to, to hear from my colleague. So she'll be talking about, um, she'll be giving a very brief overview of, of who we are and what we do. So with that, um, so here you see <clears throat> the, um, a slide here which uh, shows the current landscape of organized crime in Japan. Um, these are, this is just uh, a slide showing the top eight groups. Uh, there are 22 designated organized crime groups in Japan, and these are the top eight. Um, the top eight, the membership, uh, comprises some 37, 38,000 gangsters. Now that's a lot of gangsters. Um, that's that's a lot more than than we have in any other developed country. Um, so if you if you add up all the gangsters who are members of the 22 uh, designated groups, plus all the, the gangsters who are members of groups that are not designated as organized crime groups. You could, you probably have a good 50, 55,000, you know, plus gangsters, um, and that really represents a significant force in in society. Um, <clears throat> let me just go back to the first slide. Um, so you see the Yamaguchi Gumi with 14,000 members is number one, and even after the split, they remain the largest group. Um, the newly f formed Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi, which was formed by 13 factions that split off from the Yamaguchi Gumi, is now the number three organization, a criminal uh, organized crime group in Japan. Um, this is a slide illustrating the leadership history of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Um, 
Kazuo Taoka, the third generation leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi, I think deserves special mention here. Um, he really laid the foundations for the growth uh, of the Yamaguchi Gumi in the post-war period. Um, without him, the Yamaguchi Gumi would not be the force it is today. Um, so when he died, it really uh, ushered in a very unstable and violent period in the Yamaguchi Gumi's history. You see here that uh, the fourth generation head, Masahisa Takenaka, he only lasted a year. And then there was a, a, a sort of a gap uh, in the leadership for several years uh, until Yoshinori Watanabe, the fifth generation head, um, uh, assumed control. Then uh, we are here uh, today with uh, you know, the Yamaguchi Gumi being uh, led by uh, Shinobi Tsukasa. Um, <clears throat> so there have only been six leaders of the Yamaguchi Gumi to date, and the Yamaguchi Gumi is 101 years old. They celebrated their centennial last year, which actually was the start of the split, uh, the current split, that is. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a little bit more granular in terms of um, <clears throat> what, what happened. Uh, <clears throat> with, you know, in the, in the post Taoka period. Um, when Kazuo Taoka died, uh, Masahisa Takenaka, he uh, was appointed uh, head of the Yamaguchi Gumi. He was, he was appointed, he was named as the, uh, the fourth generation leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Um, however, um, the interim head, uh, Kumicho, Hiroshi, Hiroshi Yamamoto opposed the ascension of Takenaka. And uh, this um, triggered uh, a violent gang war. This, this really ushered in uh, a very violent uh, interregnum uh, that lasted several years. Um, Takenaka was assassinated in January uh, 1985. Um, <clears throat> the subsequent war, uh, which lasted a good four and a half years almost, um, resulted in 29 dead and 70 wounded. Um, <clears throat> stability returned to the uh, landscape, to the, the organized crime landscape, when uh, Yoshinori Watanabe became the fifth generation head of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Uh, this, ha this happened in um, the spring of 1989. Now, we are here in more recent times. Um, after uh, Yoshinori Watanabe, <clears throat> Tsukasa, uh, Shinobu Tsukasa, became uh, the leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi. He was appointed as the sixth generation leader. Um, and that's when sort of problems started to fester, uh, started to um, surface and, and uh, you know, over a period of 10 years, these problems uh, festered. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't all smooth sailing. It hasn't been smooth sailing since then. Uh, in 2008, uh, Tadamasa Goto, the leader of the Goto Gumi faction of the Yamaguchi Gumi, attempted a coup. And uh, some 10 other bosses who supported uh, Goto um, they, they were, you know, together with Goto, banished from the Yamaguchi Gumi. Um, so a mere three years after um, Tsukasa assumed uh, control of the Yamaguchi Gumi, already he had problems, uh, you know, in, in the organization. Um, <clears throat> so the current, you know, the, the problems which had been festering over uh, some 10 years really, you know, uh, after, Initially, it, it kind of came to a head in 2008 with the uh, with Goto uh, leaving, but um, it really uh, things really culminated when um, the, the the split happened, with 13 uh, factions leaving the Yamaguchi Gumi. Um, <clears throat> these 13 factions they were headed by Kunio Inoue, who's the leader of the Yamaken Gumi faction, um, and this happened in um, it happened last year. The, uh, in the centennial of the um, uh, Yamaguchi Gumi, and also on the 10th anniversary of uh, Tsukasa's ascension as the sixth generation leader. So the timing of this was not a coincidence. It was, uh, 
was by design, was meant to be a slap in the face. Um, shortly after the split, uh, the Kobe Yamaguchi-gumi, which was formed by the 13 factions which had split off, uh, they were designated as the second uh, organized crime group in Japan by the, um, uh, by the NPA, National Police Agency and Public Safety Commission. Um, Tadamasu Goto returned to Japan after the split, uh, after having received a liver transplant in the United States uh, many years ago and subsequently um, living in exile in Cambodia. Uh, he was thought to have provided strategic and financial support to the, uh, to the group that split off. Um, and it's been a rather kind of a quiet, I wouldn't say quiet, but um, uh, comparatively, it's been a low intensity conflict. I mean, this, the second split has been a, a low intensity conflict uh, as compared with the first split, which was a lot more violent and bloody. But, um, you know, the, again, um, this sort of refers back to my comment about, uh, you know, the, the laws regulating organized crime becoming stricter. So that, that has had an impact. And it has caused the um, the Yakuza to operate, uh, you know, a lot more carefully, and uh, they become smarter. Um, so I want you to study this uh, slide. This shows the, the basic organized uh, organizational uh, hierarchy of, of the Yamaguchi Gumi. So just let that sink in for for a bit. Um, because it's, it, it provides some context for the next slide. All right. Yeah, this is the actual uh, organizational chart of the central leadership of the Yamaguchi Gumi uh, before the split happened. Now, for your ease of reference, I've color-coded the guys who split off to form the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi. Um, the guys who left to form the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi are color-coded in beige, as you can see there. Tanda Masagoto, who left or was banished in 2008, is color-coded in green at the right. So as you can see here, the split was quite significant because it affected uh, every tier, every tier of the central leadership. And uh, essentially this represents uh, 6,000 plus uh, gangsters uh, in terms of the numbers of you know, people who split, who left the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi. So it is, uh, a tectonic shift in, in the uh, organized crime world. Um, so these are the original 13 that formed the uh, Yama, uh, Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi. Each constituent uh, gang is headed by their leader, obviously. Um, and uh, to be precise, uh, the, the Kobe Yamaguchi Gumi, uh, despite its name, is actually headquartered in Awaji, which is uh, not too far from Kobe. But anyway, just thought I'd mention that. Awaji is, Awaji Shi, Awaji City is, is a city on the island off of Kobe there, mm -hmm. as you can see. Um, now, I, I want to talk uh, about uh, the Yamaguchi Gumi and, and Japanese organized crimes involvement in business, their participation in the economy. Um, this <clears throat> graphic was taken from Forbes, uh, sorry, Fortune magazine. Um, it was published uh, two years ago in 2014. Um, so as you can see here, the Yamaguchi Gumi pre-split was a $6.6 .6 billion enterprise. Now that's, you know, if the Yamaguchi Gumi were a corporation, they would be, you know, a Fortune 500 corporation in the United States. Um, it's not a joke. It's it's quite significant, and probably this figure is is a conservative estimate because it's it's impossible to accurately, 
you know, uh, uh, identify all the business, uh, you know, businesses, all the sources of revenue uh, that uh, that go to the Yamaguchi Kumi. So I would say $6.6 .6 billion is a conservative estimate. Um, so according to Fortune, they're the second largest uh, criminal organization in the world. Uh, well, pre-split, anyway. Much bigger than the Italian mafia, much bigger than the um, Mexican uh, cartels. Only second to the Russian mafia. Um, <clears throat> as I think I mentioned um, several minutes ago, the, the Yamaguchi Gumi uh, and organized crime in Japan in general, they are involved in a variety of businesses. They don't just operate in the underground economy. Um, they operate extensively in the legitimate economy. So as you can see here, I mean, construction, real estate, banking, the nuclear industry, um, <clears throat> they're, they're involved. Um, and again, I mean, it's not insignificant in terms of the numbers, you know, the number of jobs that, uh, that the Yamaguchi Gumi and, and uh, the Yakuza, uh, you know, more broadly provide. Uh, we're, we're talking probably hundreds of thousands of jobs, directly or indirectly. And that's why you can't just remove them from the equation. Um, there are laws in the books. I mean, um, and as I mentioned, um, the laws regulating the activities of organized crime are becoming stricter. Um, as you can see, the first law, which was first enacted in 1992, has undergone a series of revisions, the most recent of which was uh, enacted in 2012, only four years ago. Um, now, separate from this law, there are a series of uh, prefecture-level ordinances uh, that were sort of uh, implemented serially over a number of years. And uh, the last of the ordinances came into effect in Okinawa and in Tokyo um, about five years ago. And these ordinances, um, they, they actually target, um, they, they, they seek to sever the link between organized crime and regular Japanese citizenry. So uh, the focus is a little bit different. And this is actually where companies have to be very careful because there are uh, criminal liability provisions in these ordinances. And in theory, you could be exposing yourself to criminal liability if you do business with uh, groups that are connected to organized crime. So I think it would behoove uh, businesses, companies doing business in Japan to you know, exercise caution when dealing with uh, new uh, counterparties. Um, <clears throat> now, it's not just the organized crime specific laws that people have to be uh, concerned about. It's also the anti-money laundering laws because obviously, um, you know, this targets the Japanese, the Japanese anti-money laundering law targets uh, illegal proceeds and a lot of the revenue generated by organized crime in Japan is can be considered illegal proceeds. Um, <clears throat> the anti-money laundering law, the Japanese anti-money la laundering law also has undergone a series of revisions. Um, the latest revision will be enacted in October of this year. And it imposes uh, stricter rules on financial services organizations to conduct more stringent due diligence on their customers. Um, and we've seen uh, some incidents in the past, not so recent past. Um, I, mean, I mean, not ancient history, very recent uh, cases where uh, financial services institutions, banks have been sanctioned by the authorities for having dealt with um, organized crime uh, groups or individuals. Um, so there is a legal, now a legal onus on companies doing business in Japan to conduct due diligence to ensure that whoever they're dealing with uh, are not linked with organized crime or have, um, you know, have, have sources of revenue um, generated from illegal activities. Um, 
in the Panama Papers, uh, I think uh, most of you have read about, um, there was actually um, a finding or a reference to an Inagawa Kai front company. Um, so, you know, the, the, the nature of, of organized crime is not just, you know, Japanese organized crime. Their, their scope, their reach has become transnational in nature. Um, and the Inagawa Kai, if you'll remember from my opening slide, is uh, one of the top, uh, one of the largest organized crime groups in Japan. Now I'd like to take a break uh, and turn things over to my colleague. She'll be um, just giving a brief overview of uh, who we are and what we do. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, I introduced you rather badly. Could you just say it more clearly, who, who you are and what your specific function is? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rika Takase. I work with David right here. And as Mr. Rowley introduced us, we are a risk advisory firm specializing in Asia. And as you could see on the slide, we are headquartered in Hong Kong. We also have branches in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Singapore. And our business scope, we have three types of projects that we service, which is business intelligence, due diligence, and investigations and security. Um, just a brief introduction of what these are. Um, business intelligence is mostly for our, say, hedge fund or bank clients. When they have a specific business strategy that they want to accomplish, we basically provide intel or information that could support their business strategy. Due diligence is something that um, we don't do financial or legal due diligence. We do more of the hidden risks such as political exposure or some kind of um, say fraud or something that they hid in the past. So uh, more of an undercover due diligence. Investigations and security is more of something that has become a problem such as fraud or internal investigations. So these are the three kinds of business that we propose. About our clients, um, Black Peak has executed more than a thousand risk advisory projects for over, uh, it says 240, but we have about around two, 250 clients in the past four years. Our basic clients includes, as you can see, investment banks, uh, a lot of hedge fund clients, international and lo local law firms. And for the past four years, we've been increasing clients, especially in the Asia industry, and also very looking for um, Japanese clients who are willing to go into the business abroad, so outbound Japanese business. For, so the reason why Black Peak is really focused on Asia and why it is very strong in Asia is because, well, as I said, we have six offices in Asia, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Singapore, and Tokyo, which covers the, all the major Asian markets. And we are the largest risk consulting firm specializing in the Asia Pacific region with more than 40 consultants which co um, who could speak over about 12 languages, which is most of the languages spoken in the Asia region. And our senior management, plus the four founders of our firm, has ample experience in the risk consulting industry. And we also have deep relationship with the Western and Asian or just global companies, as well as their legal advisors, um, political personnel that we have a lot of connections with. So this is just a very brief introduction of our company. Um, thank you very much for coming to us today. And I see a lot of you have picked up a brochure of our newsletter and our presentation. But if you haven't, they're in the back. And if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. Thank you for a fascinating anatomy of the Yamaguchi group. Um, one thing I'm not quite clear about, if I can just ask a quick question myself at the start, is when you say the Yamaguchi or the Yokozuna operate in the banking, construction, and uh, you know, nuclear fields, for instance, what do you mean by operate? That it rather makes it sound as though they're perfectly respectable people who are running banking businesses or construction. So how do they operate? Um, and just one more point. If you're a, a respectable businessman, um, whether foreign or Japanese, doing your business in Japan, why do you have 
anything to fear from the Yamaguchi, from the uh, Yakuza. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, basically, um, <clears throat> the organized crime groups in Japan, they're, they're very, very sophisticated. Um, <clears throat> they don't necessarily operate directly. They're, they're not, you could say they're not direct participants in legitimate, uh, you know, uh, economy. Um, but rather, they, they operate um, hundreds, probably thousands of front companies um, that are managed day to day by people who are closely uh, affiliated with or associated with uh, these Yakuza groups. Uh, some of these, these people, some of these managers who, who run these companies, uh, they may be former uh, fully initiated members of the Yakuza groups, or they may be simply just uh, close associates. And there's a term for these people uh, in organizations. It's kiyoshate in Japanese. Um, another category of, of Yakuza associate uh, would be, I guess, the, the, what we call the kyo kyoseisha, who may or may not, uh, well, I think largely they have some uh, dealings with uh, organized crime. They may uh, interact with them for some, some mutual benefit. Um, so they, they may be you know, considered a, a more, I guess, loosely affiliated uh, type of organization that um, works with uh, organized crime. So in this way, they, they operate through a web of front companies, through, through a web of associates, uh, and uh, yes, so they, they, you know, these companies could be investment firms, private equity, could be hedge funds, could be you know, these startup IT companies, could be uh, sort of lower level uh, uh, construction companies that uh, take on subcontract work. Uh, could be these uh, smaller sort of independent uh, logistics companies, trucking companies, you know, you name it. So they're there. If you're doing if you're doing your business in an honest way, why do you need to fear involvement with, with these groups? Yes. Uh, so to your second question, yes. So um, so as you could can probably begin to understand now, um, there are a lot of these companies and. <clears throat> If you're doing business, any kind of business really, um, and, and certain uh, industries are higher risk than other, others, but um, there is a chance that uh, you could inadvertently enter into a business relationship with a Yakuza Link company. And uh, again, referring back to the, uh, the laws uh, regulating organized crime, uh, you, know, you, you could be exposing yourself to, to criminal liability. Um, and if not criminal liability, um, reputational risk. So uh, it's something I think that uh, companies should um, be uh, vigilant about. Okay, questions from, yes. Uh, let's start with working press if we have questions. Are you, sorry, are you working press? Are you a journalist? Yes. Yes, of course you are, sorry. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Richard Susilo. I'm a journalist from Indonesia. Uh, first, it's not a question actually. I uh, would like to know your personality, Mr. David. Why Suzuki? So is it possible to disclose with us what is your why? Your shinori or what, if possible? My question is regarding the casino. Uh, we heard that still in uh, discussion about the casino for the Olympic 2020, so I would like to have your, your view about this casino, because from the police matter, they will uh, against this casino, of course. And the other side, uh, everybody would like to have this kind of casino in Tokyo. So please uh, give us your, your view about this uh, possibility, uh, casino and Yakuza and the uh, uh, political and also economical uh, uh, development in Japan. The second question actually about the, uh, you said it's very strict now uh, because of the uh, revising, revising uh, of these regulations against Yakuza. 
but in the other side, police also try to control uh, the Yakuza. Uh, because of this uh, very strict situation in, inside Japan, so they, they would like to survive, of course. What is the possibility to make uh, money uh, outside Japan, for example, in Indonesia, in ASEAN, in Myanmar, whatever, outside Japan? So I would like to have your opinion about this one. And regarding your... Uh, Sorry, can you keep yourself to two questions? Okay, okay. Um, did you understand the first part? Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thank you, Richard, for your questions. Um, uh, <clears throat> with respect to my name, uh, my middle initial, um, I've actually signed the guest book, so you can see what I signed. It's kanji character. It starts with a Y, phonetic. So uh, you can check that. I, I think he has access to that, right? Uh, the guest book. So... Um, and uh, David Suzuki is my real name, by the way. <laughs> um, David Y. Suzuki. I won't specify my middle name at this uh, juncture. But um, anyway, um, your question regarding the, uh, I guess, the possibility uh, of Japan legalizing casinos. Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think I have a definitive answer to that. But um, I personally would like to see casinos legalized in Japan. Because I think it's good for the economy. It provides jobs. Um, and I mean, does that mean that it's going to necessarily benefit organized crime? Um, yeah, I mean, it probably would benefit organized crime in many ways. But, um, you know, I think you got to take this into context. I mean, casinos would probably provide hundreds of jobs for <clears throat> hardworking people. And if you take the model of Singapore, if Japan takes the model of Singapore, I mean, they will. Uh, I think um, make, make a uh, conscious, conscientious effort to, um, you know, regulate, uh, you know, the the uh, the, uh, the casinos in Japan, and um, they, you know, unfortunately they they, they won't be able to completely, um, <clears throat> I guess, um, prevent uh, organized crime from benefiting in some way, but that's, 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 that's the real world. Um, your second question, um, which was... Um, operating outside Yakuza groups, operating inside the East Asia. Ah, yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, you know, they're, the, the, the organized crime groups, I mean, they, they do operate outside Japan, um, you know, particularly in... in um, other Asian countries. Uh, it's very easy for them to operate in places like Macau, uh, the Philippines, um, you know, uh, Taiwan, uh, and other countries. Um, traditionally, they've had, um, you know, uh, dealings, business dealings going back decades in, in those countries with um, uh, local organized crime groups there. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen it in our own research where there's been some uh, clear indications of uh, Japanese organized crime involvement in, you know, um, certain jurisdictions in greater China. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, next question. Yeah, gentleman at the back. My name is Khalil. I'm diplomat. Mm. Very interesting and confusing. Uh, to understand this more, if we compare the way U.S. deal or organized crime and the way Japan deal with the organized crime, what's the difference? This is my first question. So I could just be a little closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. Should I repeat the question or is this oh, no, clear? I, I, I got it. Yeah. Okay. My second question, you wrote here, as long as Japan need to prepare for Olympics and continue to run nuclear power plant, there is little chance that Yokosuka will be completely stamped. Why? Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, sir, for your question. Um, w w sorry, just for my reference, which um, mission do you represent, sir? Bahrain. Bahrain, okay, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, the main difference between the U.S. and Japanese approach to fighting 
organized crime or you know uh, their implementation of countermeasures against organized crime is that uh, as I explained in my um, in my talk um, the authorities don't want to abolish organized crime in Japan uh, because of the various reasons that I explained and it's very difficult for them to do so um, you know the Japanese government has had ample time to study what the US has done in their fight against organized crime. Um, the racketeer um, uh, influenced and organized, uh, sorry, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO for short, uh, has been on the books since 1970. Uh, so that's, you know, a good 45, almost 50 years now. And um, basically, um, the RICO is, is a anti-criminal conspiracy law. So whoever uh, commits a crime, um, there, there's a list of crimes. I think it's 25, 26 uh, crimes, uh, state and federal crimes. Um, so whoever commits a crime, um, they, and if, if, if the authorities can prove that they're operating uh, on the behalf or for the benefit of an enterprise, then the, the authorities, the prosecutors, can, can take down the whole enterprise. So that's a very, very powerful tool uh, at the disposal of the U.S. authorities. Now, they don't have that in Japan. And in theory, um, you would think, why, why wouldn't they, you know, I mean, they, they could do it very quickly uh, in Japan. They could do the same thing. But they don't do the same thing. And it's, you know, I believe it's because of the reasons that I, I explained in my talk. Um, so that's, hopefully that, that answers uh, your first question. Um, your second question. Now, the, there's a labor shortage in Japan. Um, and when you, when you talk about uh, certain industries, like, um, for example, the, the nuclear industry, and more specifically, more precisely, if, if you talk about the, the cleanup in Fukushima, um, I mean, it's very, I think it's pretty hard to find people who would want to go up there to work. Um, so, you know, who, who provides labor for, for that? Um, who has, who has the networks, who has the wherewithal to, to bring those workers up to Fukushima now? And, uh, you know, it's organized crime. And there are other industries where, um, there, there, there are acute labor shortages. So organized crime, they, they, you know, they, they can fill those gaps. Um, construction, uh, I think I mentioned in my talk, that's, that's, a, big, uh, that's a big business. Uh, you know, a high degree of participation of organized crime in, in construction. Now construction, um, it, I think the construction industry is probably the biggest employer in Japan, directly and indirectly. So we're not talking um, peanuts here in terms of the impact, the economic impact uh, that uh, these jobs have. So, uh, and when you have such an entrenched, entrenched player in a big industry such as construction, um, you know, how are you going to eliminate that? It's, it's pretty much physically impossible to do that. So, um, yes, uh, the organized crime groups, uh, the Yakuza will I believe remain an in integral part of Japanese uh, the Japanese economy for 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 a long time. Thank you. Okay. Please. Hello, my name is Christian Howes. I work for SNBC Nico Securities, so I have some familiarity with, with some of the rules that you cited uh, before. Um, I'm particularly interested in two points. One is changes in the overall mix, Yamaguchi being the biggest, as you've outlined, we hear stories of, for instance, uh, overseas uh, syndicate type organizations coming into parts of Tokyo or other parts of the country. How is that happening and, and why? Is, is, are certain businesses that they relied on becoming less profitable or you know, how is that happening? It would seem to me that organizations that have such strict discipline would be pretty good at controlling territories and, and so forth, but I, I didn't get that one. Question two, how is the 
move away from the use of cash in Japan be going to affect uh, many of the businesses? Uh, you mentioned many of them are front companies, are fairly, fairly sophisticated, but it also seems that a fair number of these businesses are still cash intensive, nightclubs, gambling, et cetera. So if, as people go more and more to cashless society, is that going to put more and more pressure on these business models? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for your questions. Um, I think the um, <clears throat> the gradual encroachment of you know by foreign organized criminal groups into areas traditionally controlled by the Japanese uh, yakuza. Um, this is uh, really, um, I think, uh, a result, uh, one sort of consequence of the authorities cracking down on uh, or more strictly regulating. Uh, uh, the Yakuza's activities. Um, yeah, one example is, I guess, Kabukicho, where you see a lot of Chinese uh, groups operating. Um, so this, this is something that, um, you know, again, it's, it's very hard for, um, you know, for the, for, for, the, for the Japanese Yakuza to maintain their control in a comprehensive manner. It's very difficult to do when um, the authorities are making, you know, it hard for you. So that's, you know, I, I think that's a big factor. Um, and there are, there are a lot of Chinese illegal immigrants uh, in Japan. So it's, fer it's fertile recruiting ground for, for these Chinese uh, criminal groups that are operating. And um, there probably is some, some element of state control as well. Um, I would bet that uh, some of these illegal immigrants in Kabukicho and other places uh, from China. Um, they, you know, they don't just work for organized criminal groups. They they may also work for state actors. So, um, you know, the, the, these combine these forces combine to 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 make a very powerful mix. Um, you know, uh, your with respect to your second question, um, you know, the move towards a cashless society to cashless um, sort of uh, economic sort of context. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned in my talk, the, the, the Yakuza, they're very good at uh, sort of adapting to, uh, to new environments. So um, I think you'll see some of these smaller startup IT companies getting into that space and it probably already is already happening. With uh, with these uh, startup companies, um, you know, um, and you have some very very uh, very talented uh, young people who don't fit in, but they're very good with IT, and you know, uh, I think they're drawn to these these newer types of companies, um, and um, you know, it's the new economy has exploded in the states. You have Silicon Valley and. You'll probably have uh, something similar in Japan. Well, it's already happening in Japan with, uh, uh, you know, in increasing numbers of companies uh, coming, coming up and, uh, um, you know, participating in uh, new facets facets of uh, the Japanese economy. Okay, uh, Makoto. Mm. Koto Honju Associate. Oh, sorry. Uh, two questions. Um, you were just mentioning China, and uh, I see that you have many offices in China and Hong Kong, and I was wondering uh, what kind of presence the Chinese uh, Pangs or Tangs or whatever they were called um, uh, has have within the entire context of the um, organized crime in the Asian scene, because I do realize that there are some listed companies in Hong Kong which are actually gangster owned so um, <clears throat> um, and then the other one is um, earlier uh, about, probably about six months ago we had a presentation by a Japanese journalist uh, about the uh, split of the Yamaguchi Gumi and uh, one of his contentions was that um, because the royalties that the uh, people down the line had to pay to the uh, headquarters in Yamaguchi was so high 
that was because that was the major reason for the Kobe and Agoshigumi to split out, and they and therefore and thus they charge a much lower sort of royalty to their um, <clears throat> underlings and so on. And so I think the, the presentation at that time was that this kind of economic squeeze that is happening uh, is probably going to lessen their power in Japan. And I would like to hear your opinion about that. Yes, thank you for your questions. Um, the, fir the first, maybe I'll go in reverse. I'll address your second question first. Um, yeah, it, it's thank you for bringing that up because um, it's something that I actually forgot to mention in my uh, talk. But um, yeah, um, a couple of reasons why the split happened. Um, one big reason was because the uh, after uh, Shinobu Tsukasa, uh, you know, took control of the Yamaguchi Gumi, and you know he's from the Kodokai faction, which is based in Nagoya, so they took the mantle. They changed um, kind of the 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 um, the requirements for uh, subordinate gangs in terms of you know the vig they would kick up you know the the um, uh, the dues that they would have to pay to the to the upper echelon of the Yamaguchi Gumi, and these dues uh, were quite extortionate. So this this is a big reason for the discontent. Um, Another reason was because of, you know, the fact that um, Tsukasa, he systematically moved to demote the other factions in the power structure, in the Yamaguchi Gumi power structure, specifically the Yamaken Gumi, which had for a long time been the most powerful faction in the Yamaguchi Gumi. So he promoted his fellow Kodokai faction members to the upper uh, to the senior posts um, so these were two two of the well there are several reasons but two significant reasons the uh, the discontent uh, sort of um, started to happen and um, uh, came to a head uh, last year um, did I answer the first question uh, as sorry your second question fairly comprehensively <laughs> I'm, I'm having a senior moment. Was that, you know, as a result of the uh, lower royalties or dues or whatever it is, um, the, the, pres the earlier presentation we had was that the uh, power of the, uh, of the organized crowd. Can you speak to the mic, because I'm listening to the video, I'm going to understand what this is all about. I think the, um, the other tier of the question was that uh, as a result of the lower sort of tariff structure uh, that has that has come in from the uh, Kobe Yamaguchi and the trend that is happening in that direction, uh, the economic um, clout, shall I say, of the uh, organized crime has been going down. That was the earlier sort oh. of presentation we had, and I was wondering what comment you had. Um, yes, I think in the short term it's going to affect the. Um the operations of uh, the Yamaguchi Gumi and just sort of it's putting into place a new norm, um, kind of a new. Um, <clears throat> it's a new. It's it's the new normal for them. So, I think in the short term it'll have a, a deleterious impact on their operations. But um, over the medium to long term, you know, as I say, as I said before, you know. Um, the eggs are very good at adapting, so they will find ways to adapt. And over time, uh, there won't be such a such an impact. I think. Um, now, in terms of uh, you know the these these foreign groups um, operating, you know, other Asian organized crime groups operating in the region. Um, yes, uh, in Hong Kong, there are certain listed companies which are basically run by members of the triad societies. Um, the situation in greater China is a little bit different than it is here in Japan. Um, I know that in Hong Kong at least, it's actually illegal to be a triad member. Um, so unlike in Japan, it's not illegal to be a Yakuza member or a member of uh, Borokudan, a uh, designated crime group. So. Um, that's one big difference. Um, however, they are actually quite resilient, as the Yakuza are here. Um, 
and they, there, there are various ways for them to sort of avoid uh, getting caught, avoid being prosecuted. Um, and a lot of these, uh, these uh, gang members, uh, they operate under the radar. Um, it's, the triad societies are fundamentally secret societies as opposed to the Yakuza, which are not secret societies in the same sense. So, um, and again, uh, these people uh, that are operating in Hong Kong, uh, a lot of them uh, are directors and big shareholders of um, listed companies. So, again, very, very sophisticated, uh, heavy involvement in legitimate sectors of the economy over there. Um, I, I, can I just clarify a point again? I'm sorry, I, I, maybe I'm laboring this point, but if you're an honest foreign company doing business in Japan, you say you could inadvertently become involved with Yakuza groups, but w does that automatically make you criminally liable? I mean, if you simply say, well, I didn't know that, um, I had no idea who these people were, why is that in itself a, a dangerous thing to do? I mean, I can see that they're undesirable people to be doing business with, but is it such a, such a bad thing to, be, to become involved? In, inadvertently or not? Um, I guess, you know, morally, it's not a bad thing to, if you just, you know, like inadvertently became involved with, uh, you know, in a business dealing or relationship with um, a company linked, linked to organized crime. But, um, you know, there's, there still is, uh, you know, a reputational risk, um, you know, reputational ramifications. If it were to become public, if your relationship with that company were to become public, that wouldn't be a good thing, right? Uh, regardless of how you came to, you know, know this company. Um, now, if, if you're a small business, it may not matter. And, you know, in all likelihood, nothing will happen, right? But if you, if you are a, uh, a multinational company, if you're a global bank and you happen to uh, get caught out, uh, it could be very bad. I mean, reputationally and otherwise. So uh, these are real risks that uh, one has to be um, mindful of. We're up against time limit, but if we have one quick, yes, you have uh, one. Take one more question. Very interesting again. Now, how powerful their money in election? The second question, how risky is your job? Thank you. Okay, um, maybe I'll start with the second question, which is easier. Um, uh, right now, it's uh, I would say it's less risky than it was uh, you know, like maybe 20 years ago when I was doing a lot of undercover work in Hong Kong. But um, you know that doesn't mean I should be complacent. Um, you know, uh, I try to be careful, um, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, um, I have to decide whether or not I want to be in the business. If I want to be in the business, then um, I have to be prepared to uh, take certain calculated risks. So, but I, I try to be careful. Um, your first question, um, actually, we haven't done research specifically, you know, looking at, 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 this, uh, at this matter, you know, uh, so I, I couldn't give you a definitive answer right now, but I, I would think that there's some, obviously some um, not insignificant uh, degree of influence in, you know, in politics. So thank you. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm afraid we're out of time, which is a pity because it's a fascinating subject and um, so much so we hope you'll come back again and give us another um, briefing on the subject at some point in time. In the meantime, um, I'd like to give you a one-year honorary membership of the club. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.